Only in recent years have supercapacitors begun to be used as energy storage. What has so far slowed down their use in electric traction and photovoltaic storage is the high cost, at least four to five times that of the corresponding lithium batteries. A disadvantage of supercapacitors is the lower energy density per kilograms than in lithium cells. Another disadvantage is the no load leakage current, which causes a supercapacitor to discharge much more quickly of a battery. Now let's look at these things in more detail. Supercapacitors can be classified as double layer electrochemical capacitors, EDLC, or pseudocapacitors based on their energy storage potential, as shown on the screen. Electrochemical double layer capacitors, EDLC, store charge in the electric field between two electrodes. Pseudocapacitors, store charge by reversible redox reactions on the surface of the electrodes. Hybrid capacitors, combine the features of EDLC and pseudocapacitors to achieve higher energy and power density. On the screen, a rag and plot of different energy storage devices. This graph presents the power densities of various energy storage devices, along with the vertical axis, versus their energy densities, along with the horizontal axis. Electrochemical supercapacitors currently fill the gap between batteries and conventional solid state and electrolytic capacitors. Despite greater capacitances than conventional capacitors, electrochemical supercapacitors are yet to match the energy densities of mid to high end batteries. In recent years due to extensive research of new electrode materials, improved understanding of iron behavior, and the design of new hybrid systems combining capacitive and pseudo-capacitive electrodes, have increased the performance of supercapacitors. On the screen a comparison of the characteristics of capacitors, supercapacitors and batteries. Important data of supercapacitors are the speed of charging and discharging, the efficiency close to 100% and the life, up to 1 million cycles of charge, discharge, versus 2,000 cycles of lithium batteries. Now a comparison of the leakage currents of primary, secondary batteries and supercapacitors. This is one of the shortcomings of supercapacitors, high sulfur discharge. A supercapacitor loses 1.8% of its charge in a day, compared to 4% per month for a lithium battery, but this will be better demonstrated in an experimental trial. In a battery, the output voltage remains stable during discharge. In a supercapacitor no, and decreases exponentially governed by the time constant RC, as you can see in the image, the internal resistance of the supercapacitor is neglected here because it is much smaller than the load resistance. From all this it follows that while a battery can directly power a load, the supercapacitor cannot do so, but needs a DC slash DC converter who stabilizes the output voltage of the desired value. On the screen is a concise example of photovoltaic storage with supercapacitors. The solar panel proceeds to charge the supercapacitors B, under the control of the comparator A, which opens the circuit when the voltage of the ends of the block of supercapacitors reach 12 V. Note that the four strings of five capacitors in series require a separate circuit for voltage balancing. The output voltage from the supercapacitors feeds the C converter. It is very important that this converter is capable of working even with low supply voltages, in this case 2 volts, so the maximum energy accumulated by the capacitors is recovered. At the output of the converter C the voltage is stabilized at 14 volts even when the input voltage has dropped to 2 volts. The output voltage from the converter is sent to the inverter D, which transforms it into mains voltage of 230 volts 50 hertz. On the screen you can see another practical use of supercapacitors. Complete diagram of a LED lamp powered by 424 at supercapacitors. For a complete description go to the video. An efficient lamp for emergencies. Now I proceed to a series of measurements on a 24 amp supercapacitor from the BICAP. On the left, you can see the equivalent circuit of a supercapacitor. For the measurement of the capacitance I propose two methods. The simplest one is described on the screen, but it is not the most precise one.
The second method is more accurate, requiring only a constant current power supply in addition to the other two tools. Below is the video of the capacity measurement. First of all, I make sure that the power supply delivers a constant current of 1 ampere. It is essential for the accuracy of the measure. I connect the capacitor to the power supply, and the voltage of the ends of the capacitor starts to rise. When it reaches 1.5 volts I trigger the stopwatch and I finish counting when the voltage measured by the voltmeter reaches 2.5 volts. The stopwatch reads 19.44 seconds. Put the value in the equation I get a capacitance of 1944 farads, very close to the 20 farads of the capacitor. The screen describes in detail the procedure for measuring ESR resistance. Equivalent series resistance. Tools needed. A constant current power supply calibrated to deliver 1 ampere, and a multimeter with the hold button. Below is a video with the ESR measurement on a 24 ohm supercapacitor. Now the ESR resistance measurement. The constant supply current is first adjusted to exactly 1 ampere.
I take the 1.025V voltage reading at the ends of the supercapacitor. I connect the positive terminal of the capacitor to the power supply by means of a cable and a fraction of a second later I press the hold button of the multimeter. A new voltage is immediately stored. 1.066V and this is the voltage step that allows me to get the ESR resistance. The classic instrument for this measurement is the digital storage oscilloscope, DSO. On the screen is an example of a graph that is obtained in an ESR measure, using this tool. The reading to be taken into account is the initial voltage step. This is what we measured using the multimeter with the hold button. On the screen the calculation of the ESR resistance, which is 41 milliohms, just a little higher than the manufacturer's claim of 37.5 milliohms. I performed a test to evaluate the self-discharge in this new 24 amp supercapacitor. The capacitor was charged for the first time at 2.6 volts and then left idle for 1,400 hours. In the first 100 hours the voltage dropped below 1.5 volts. Then the voltage drops again but much more slowly reaching 115 volts after 1,400 hours, 58 days. In this second graph I have compared two sulfur discharge curves over 40 to 70 hours. The one related to the first charge and that of the second charge. After the second charge, the self-discharge in the capacitor decreases a lot. Most likely a few cycles of discharge charge will be enough to stabilize it on more than acceptable values. Conclusions. Supercapacitors have great development prospects. As far as photovoltaic storage is concerned, they could already replace lithium or lead acid batteries today. Here the high sulfur discharge rate is not penalizing considering that the stored energy is usually consumed in 24 to 48 hours. The only penalizing factor is their high cost, which limits applications in this field. As far as vehicles are concerned, the limiting factor here is the high footprint and high sulfur discharge compared to batteries. Certainly, the future development of hybrid supercapacitors with higher energy capacities and lower self-discharge currents could solve the problem. Thank you for your attention. To the next.